First, I want to thank you all for being here. I know it's been a long day and you've all um, heard a lot of different perspectives and um, spend time listening and learning. So it means a lot to me that you're here at the end of the day. What I want to say is in the last few panels, I've heard the words of uh, diversity, the words of inclusion. And you're going to hear those words with me today, but you're also going to hear another word. And you're going to hear the word equality. And we're going to talk about it in a way that I don't think many people have ever talked about it before. But uh, brace yourselves and get ready to think different. We're going to have a good time together. So here we go. Imagine if everyone in this room, everyone everywhere, was equally respected, equally confident, equally welcomed, and equally listened to when they shared an insider opinion reflecting their unique experience, perspective, and care. Imagine if we weren't struggling with each other. Imagine if we weren't struggling with each other, competing to see who would dominate or win, whose voice would be the loudest, or who would be proven right. Imagine if we opened our minds thoughtfully to each other, letting the best ideas between us form even better ideas and better understanding at a new level of shared insight. Now, you might think this is unrealistic or idealistic, but I respectfully invite you to think different. Imagine what might be possible if equality, real equality, were granted to each of us like the birthright it is. That, it turns out, is how it actually should be. The only problem is we got lost. And we can trace how we got lost through history to the times where an idea of one group of humans being dominant or superior to another was first written, shared, and perpetuated as a form of social or cultural organization. One, I might add, that favored the very subset that wrote the story. That story, as you will learn today, comes at a very high cost. In my 35 years in technology, I've paid close attention to the way gender and equality dynamics affect productivity, business success, and life satisfaction. It's a topic I write about often, explore in my book, The Happiness Hack, and share whenever I can on Twitter at my account, Cheptoom. And I study this topic from three angles, from the perspective of cognitive and applied neuroscience, systems thinking, and timeless wisdom practices. And we'll touch on each of those today. Let's start with a look at how the brain works, for better or for worse. It turns perceptions into assumptions. And if we're exposed to these perceptions early, frequently, or strongly enough, these assumptions turn into what we believe are truths. I could speak all day on how profoundly brain's assumptions, a type of cognitive shortcut, form our perceptions as much as what is really happening. And what is really happening from a cognitive or perceptual level, that is a whole other day's talk. But the brain relies on familiar routines, biases or assumptions, because they're very efficient, not necessarily because they're accurate or because they're real. To save energy, the brain prioritizes processing in the older and faster cognitive areas, the parts that evolved earlier in our human history. And it resists the more uniquely human and hungry and energy inefficient modalities of the prefrontal cortex, the newest part of our brain. This helps the brain save energy for all of the prehistoric scenarios it evolved to help navigate. After all, the brain's job isn't actually to think. It's to think in service of keeping us safe and alive. Running efficiently, though, comes at a trade-off. We convert the shared assumptions of everyday life into a sort of cognitive baseline, what is. This is our concept of reality on the level that the brain runs. And this is much more accessible to the brain than the objective, intentional, and more expensive thought of the prefrontal cortex. See, the PFC, which is the home of critical thinking, mood regulation, long-term planning, and on the other hand, thinking, and even our most intentional thoughts, uses a lot of energy. That's why the brain resists turning it on. The brain believes stories that it's learned on an assumptive basis and hardwired to the older and more efficient parts of the brain. 
even when they are not objectively real. This is how we've been conditioned, and we've all been conditioned. We receive messages from our earliest days about where we fit in, largely based on gender, but in many other conscious or subconscious vectors as well. And these messages become the foundation of who we are, where we fit in, and how we are meant to conduct ourselves and our lives. But as I said earlier, that is simply a mental construct, a story, and the story is changing. Some of that change is fueled by the shift we're all experiencing as a wider range of representative voices continues to rise. But some of it comes from the latest research into human history, a new view beyond the assumptions and biases of prior interpretations. The new research suggests that the longest standing and most flourishing cultures in human history were built solidly on a single principle, equality. In these cultures, women and men were full equals in every regard. These are the San people, inhabitants of the Kalahari Desert and the longest surviving intact human society. For 100,000 years, think about that, 100,000 years, something was working. For 100,000 years, the San have sustained and even flourished in a thriving society in one of the planet's harshest environments. A secret to their survival is a social code that is void of any thoughts or words of gender inequality. Leadership in this culture is equally female and male. Role division and conditioning of children shows absolutely no preference for either gender. Equality, it turns out, is a cornerstone of this incomparably sustainable society, one that actively preserves partnership between genders as a way of life. And it's not only true there. You can span the globe, finding cultures all around the world, the longest sustained cultures, which are hunter-gatherer societies. And if we look back over time and over all human population, all of us come from these societies. 99% of human life, many people speculate, have actually lived over time in hunter-gatherer societies. So the story that most of human survival has been sustained by cultures of equality is, it turns out, more plausible than any other story historians and archeologists can support. So what changed? Well, in the Western world, we can look to Europe in Neolithic times. Back then, Minoan Crete was the pinnacle of human innovation and culture. Recent archeological research has pointed to the secret of the civilization's abundant innovation, wealth, and creativity, radical equality. This flourishing, technologically progressive, and peaceful society seems, per the archeological record, to have been female-led, yet with men playing equally important roles balanced, equal, and no gender dominating over the other. No civilization of that time mastered more architectural, artistic, or agricultural innovation. Skill in metalwork, a love of sports, lavish art, and organized systems for bringing water, housing, and agriculture, collectively storing food and more, hints at the abundance of this culture. Peaceful and organized, the Neolithic Minoans directed their energy to making life better and truly more beautiful for all. They lived, it seems, following what is known as the partnership model, the same model alive in hunter-gatherer groups who formed much of our early human blueprint. But then, unfortunately, something changed. Volcanic catastrophes literally blew the center out of the Minoan homeland. And over the following century, marauders stormed in from every direction. The Minoan life turned from the comfortable, peaceful life to one of defense. The bronze once used for agriculture and art was now forged into weapons, largely to be used against the Minoans. Within 100 years, dominance overtook partnership, and the culture that rose from it ancient Greece, generated and spread myths, laws, and frameworks that reimagined women and their place in society as subordinates. The new philosophical and ideological order depended on winning and leaving partnership behind. And thus, a new story began.
This new story formed the foundations of Western civilization, a civilization that has come to influence much of what we call the modern world. New hierarchies and power structures took root and they favored the very group that created them, the self-declared superiors, which were men. Now, any concept of non-equality is simply a story, but stories are built and stories are learned and stories are perpetuated across generations until we no longer see them as stories, we see them as real. But with this new human story, we can trace the path to changes like these, the ideas that, that prevail in the hierarchies and organizations of the workplace. This is actually something, um, it's a quote from a movie, and he genuinely says, well, I can remember the good old days when there were all men in my department and we didn't have these problems. But as you're gonna see, they're not problems that we have. They're opportunities. They're opportunities to use our brains better with a different type of story. And yet, it persisted, and one group was kept down and kept quiet and underrepresented as a right result of these differences. And the messages speak for themselves. Now, it's important to be scientific here and not to do blaming or shaming of men or of any other group, nor certainly, excuse me, of Western civilization, which has brought so many benefits to the world. Yet we've all been exposed to these stories and conditioned to believe them. We've acted on them as if they are truths. Perhaps even the, women, the men and the women in this room will agree that all of us have paid a price for this story and the roles it has limited us to. That's what conditioning is. It's the recording of commonly held agreements and assumptions to the point where the brain begins to believe they are real and build all other perceptions of reality upon them. Perceptions become reality, and this shows up powerfully in the workplace today, and that is a problem for all of us. Young, confident women more and more feel within only two years of their career that it's not worth the uphill battle, the headwind they feel they face, simply to fit in and make sense as they navigate the workplace. Bain and company, company deeply researched the gap between women's expectations of collaborative, partner-oriented workplace relationships and the competitive, often dominating hierarchies that most report finding once they're on the job. Whereas women arrive in the workplace full of confidence and ambition, within only a few years they begin to question, is it worth it? What am I missing? Why don't I understand? This is the price we've paid for that story of inequality. And we're losing talent, we're losing engagement, and we're losing opportunity because of it. This costs us all. It impacts engagement, the availability of talent, and truly business potential. We, all of us, can do better. So here is a more accurate story. Getting away from the bias, we can see that an outdated story is holding us back. The story says objectively that women contribute less, that they need to stand up, that they need to lean in, that they need to be more dominating in order to succeed. No one lives well with that story. No one succeeds. We can do better than that with a partnership model. But before we examine that, let's look at a bigger story of women and their contributions. Take Grace Hopper and her incomparable contributions to the world of early computing. Long before that, Ada Lovelace with her early explorations of mathematics and code. The computers that so many of us saw in human figures, them and the, th the, uh, the countless others who joined them. Inventor and World War II hero, Hedy Lamarr. Pharmacologist and Nobel Prize winner, Yu Yu Tu, with no formal pharmacology education who found a breakthrough solution to curing malaria. Visionary biologist and system thinker Wangari Matai. And Durba Banjari, India Airlines first pilot, not first female pilot, first pilot, and pioneering commercial aviatrix. And so many more.
I'm sure you recognize some of these pioneering women as I turn my pages here. We are not the story we've been told. We need to accept and maybe even do some grieving over the fact that we are more than what we have been allowed to be. All of us, men and women alike, have paid a huge price for inequality of any and every form. Holding any subgroup of society back limits the flourishing of every other group. It may not seem like it on the surface, but as you look deeper, it truly is. And we will all benefit when we change this story. Need proof? Well, the panelists who spoke earlier hinted at some of it, but let's back this up with facts. Companies who are in the top quartile for gender diversity are 15% more likely to outperform industry norms. Equality makes us all successful. Companies with diverse, inclusive, equality-based teams consistently move to the top echelon of financial success. And it's linear. If you want your company to move more, according to the statistics, simply keep increasing diversity. The progression continues up and to the right. So far, we haven't found a place where that progression stops. The benefits go beyond the strong financial results. There's more accuracy and fewer errors. Up to 60% more accuracy in predicting stock prices, um, modeling financial, creating financial models, and backing, backing models with facts when you have num and backing financial models with facts, the more diversity there is at the team. 50, 50 to 60% more accuracy. There's higher creativity and innovation. If you have diversity and equality on the team, you are 80% more likely to ship a radically innovative new product within two years of hiring that team. Radically better implementation. This one is my favorite. With 60% more uh, accuracy, effectiveness, and less friction as you go to market with products that have been created by diverse teams. This one is essential to all of us, stronger compliance, stronger ethics, fewer legal problems on teams that embrace full equality. Now one of the things that we have to note here is high, there is higher profitability, retention, and growth. But I'm leaving something out, and that something is it's a little bit harder to get started. And I'm gonna show you why on a cognitive level in a moment. It's harder to get started because people don't agree. When different voices come to the room and a multiplicity of perspectives is, sh is shared, people don't come to the easy conclusions. They work harder to get to solutions, come to agreement, and it takes longer to move through the difficult parts. And once they have been moved through, the hard work is done, implementation and market results speak for themselves. Term, teams with diversity outperformed less diverse teams by a 53% return on equity, a 66% return on capital, and significantly higher sales. Simply put, equality-based teams are simply more successful. I like to think it's because they're smarter. The cognitive dissonance of working with people respectfully who are not like you actually takes you out of those routine parts of your brain and moves you into the prefrontal cortex where higher human cognition and information processing takes place. The brain resists this, which is possibly why the brain resists diversity. It wants people who agree with it so that it doesn't have to do the hard and energy consumptive work of using its best parts but only in situations where there is diversity, inclusion, and equality can the brain shift into that modality and start to come up with better solutions. This is something I refer to as the homogeneity hijack. Many of you, <laughs> many of you have heard of the amygdala hijack, the fight and flight response. If you look cognitively at what happens with the brain, the homogeneity hijack keeps you as effectively in the routine and less creative, less higher functioning parts of the brain as the actual amygdala hijack, the fight or flight response does. Now I've said diversity. And diversity means getting a representative group of people all into the same room. And that is a great start. I've also said inclusion, which is making sure the voices of those people come into the room and are all heard. But the real word we are after here is equality. And equality is hard. In order to have equality, we have to challenge our stories. 
And these stories have been programmed into us, not only all of our lives, but for generation after generation. But this is the state where we really are all equally confident, respected, welcomed, and listened to, valued for our unique perspectives, not discounted because those perspectives don't map to that of the prevailing group. And more and more, we are seeing the value of embracing this approach. The change begins here with us. The change begins with you. And you might be wondering, what can you do? What can we all do to challenge the story and embrace the potential of radical equality? First, we can amplify. When we hear a voice heard that is the type of voice that isn't usually heard, give credit to it, point to it, make sure others know that this is the person who originated the thought. This was a highly successful technique in the Obama White House. And in my opinion, if it's good enough for the Obama White House, it's good enough for us. Balance voices. One thing I do in my coaching with Silicon Valley companies is we find ways to start meetings where we make it very clear that everyone in the room is going to have an equal chance to speak. Leaders and managers sometimes have to take the over contributors and ask them to save their thoughts for later to make room for other people who might be less likely to speak if there's a dominant voice in the room. But bringing these voices of balance into the room changes everything in these group dynamics. It is highly worth the effort. This one is so important. Oh, excuse me. I beg your pardon. Stay with the friction. There is friction. You know, if we were to go into this room and find someone who had a very different background than we had, and we were to try to solve a problem together, at first we'd find a lot of friction, wouldn't we? It would be hard. Other people would say, no, this is the way we've always done it. No, but it has to be done this way. But if you stay with this, with respect, curiosity, and really remembering that they are your equal, the facts are in, you will come up with a better solution than any of you could have come up with on your own or that you would have come up with with someone who thought like you. And this one, and I'm speaking to everyone in this room, is to have empathy. You know, I don't think men can really imagine what it's like to be a woman in a room, to walk in, feeling that from the start you sometimes have something that you have to prove or protect or pretend simply to show up in the room. I don't know what they feel like to stand in the back of the room waiting to speak as I have at a conference, not at this one, but at another conference, and had a man from the room ask me where he should put his water glass. You know, that was a moment where empathy was required. And all I said to the man is, well, I put mine over there, but I'm curious, what made you think that I was a good person to ask that question? And we ended up having a wonderful conversation. And he realized that this was his bias about a story he had been told. And this comes to us as women. We have to have empathy for men. They're in the same soup, in the same situation we are. And if the dominator model hasn't worked for us, and trust me, it hasn't worked for us, it's not going to work if we are trying to be the dominators. We must come to this place of partnership where we lead as the equals we are and the equals we want everyone else to be. Equality doesn't discriminate. It's either equality or domination. We choose what will it be. And by all means, share the facts. The facts are more and more of them every day about the benefits of diversity and the amount of power that companies that embrace it and people who embrace it are finding as they lead and as they shape the future we all will share. It's time to move beyond this story. And we all have to be proactive. We have to be the change we actually want in the world. And that begins with everyone in this world in this room, excuse me, really thinking of what does it mean to go forth as an equal? Nothing more and nothing less. Really accepting and believing that everyone we interact with is our equal. And wondering, being curious, if their ideas, their perspectives, their talent might be exactly the thing we need to unlock the greatness we're here to achieve. I thank you so much for your time and for your attention. And I am on Twitter if you wish to follow me. From time to time, I will be sharing articles on this topic. And I would really love to hear your thoughts on how I can share this vision for equality and partnership better and more with audience who might be interested. I'd also be happy to cite some of the sources that I've used. You may find them interesting. But the research on the early partnership societies and the power that it gave to all humans who lived in it is some of the most exciting 
research that I've read in recent years. And if we learn from it and we go forth thinking as equals, believing as equals, sharing as equals and working with equals, I believe we can get to a place that is so much better even than the place we have gotten to today. And I hope you will all join in that journey toward equality. And I thank you very much.